All right. Tony Rolling Carey. Rolling the machine. We're rolling the machine with Tony Carey here and uh, the man that's always busy. How's it going these days? Well, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> Constantly. Really I, had a, I had a bad year last year. I mean, you might not know this. I had cancer. And I was in the hospital for, uh, I've operated five, or five times and I was in the hospital for months and months. And I had bladder cancer and now I'm uh, missing a lot of my organs, but not the Hammond. I still have the Hammond organ. Okay, that's good. And uh, But I survived it, unlike Ronnie. And uh, I'm fine, actually. I'm, I'm awful busy. I'm in the studio all the time, and we're playing. I'm doing the tour right now, and et cetera. But the big story in my last few years, of course, is my cancer, which, I, as I said, I survived, and here I am. So, so you're feeling comfortable now? Everything's going good? You are, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long period of adjustment. I had the... I was diagnosed with the with the cancer last February, and in May, it was the first of the five operations, and so I had you know I had a heavy year, but yeah, now I'm good, and I can I'm traveling a lot, and and I'm I'm, I'm kind of used to it, and there are certain things I have to do. I won't go into them for your audience, <laughs> but uh, certain pieces of equipment I have to wear and everything, and people who know about anything about bladder cancer will know what I'm talking about. But yeah, I'm used to it, and I'm fine. I'm 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 very very lucky to be alive, and I'm very very happy that I'm alive. So I have a, a wonderful family, and they helped me through it, and it's okay. Well, I'm glad you know you are doing good. Yeah, didn't you, you probably didn't know that, right? I did not know that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really like announce it or anything. I wanted to make sure I survived first. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you uh, did good. Yeah, and I did, and now I'm doing a. I'm in this. Actually, I'm cleaning up the kitchen. If you want to know, it's uh, about four in the afternoon here. I'm by Munich in Germany, so now I'll sit down and talk to you instead of cleaning up the kitchen. So you're cleaning up the kitchen, and you know, yeah. everything's going good and everything's clean there. I'm sure now. No, not yet. I'm not not yet. I'm, I have guests over for dinner in about two hours, so I'm doing the dishes, and then I'm going to set the table, and then I'm going to cook something, just like. Oh, and I'm looking at my pet rabbits in the backyard. Oh, pet maybe rabbits. You the birds, maybe you can hear the birds chirping. Yeah, a little outside. bit. Outside, you hear the birds? Yeah, I actually do. Mm -hmm. Wild birds, not pets. Just birds, you know, just birds, yeah. Right on. What have you been doing for music, you know, any projects going music? on? Music, what's that? i tell you what, I, I did, uh, I had my busiest year ever as as kind of a therapy, you know, for the last... 30 years I've been doing solo albums, and, and but mostly producing. I've produced, uh, if you go on, on uh, if, you, if you Google me and go to my official website, you'll see. i produced people like Joe Cocker and John Mayall and Chris Norman and just everybody that, that came to Germany to want to get an album made. And I made uh, about 30 solo albums and five Planet P albums. So I've been busy, uh, but then... But then last year, I don't know what language I'm speaking. I just said Abba, which is German for butt. Okay. And uh, last year when I got out of the hospital in July, I did a Christmas album and a covers album. I did a bunch of the songs I knew growing up, Creedence Clearwater songs and Curtis Mayfield songs and everything. And I produced a couple of Swedish bands, and now I'm... Uh, writing and playing with a, a German heavy metal band, he uh, Zed Yago, great band, and I'm getting ready to do a tour of Sweden as as Tony Carey. So I got I really felt it was really easy for me to get back into the studio. I I, I, had, I had worried that I wouldn't be able to work, you know, mm -hmm. or that I wouldn't feel like working. I'd be depressed or something. But really, I just I just went right back into my studio and and worked. 16 hour days like four months in a row so before i before i even went out of the house so i got a lot done and them that cheered me up that's awesome yeah and you know where, where are you from that you say awesome awesome nova scotia canada yeah awesome dude <laughs> oh then you know the trailer park boys yes we do uh, I, I just discovered them just recently i'm completely in love with them i just watched countdown to liquor day i think they're the funniest thing i've ever seen in my life and i'm Illegally downloading all the Trailer Park Boys movies. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, awesome, dude. Awesome, dude. It's like if yeah. I'm from California all of a sudden. You know, surfer surfer guy. Yeah. You know, I've been here since 1978, and uh, I used to get back to the, to the States a lot when uh, my parents were alive, and they dad died in the 90s. And so I haven't been actually... Uh, well, I was back for a rainbow rehearsal in uh, last year, but... 
other than that, I haven't been back to America much the whole time. I, I really like Europe because I'm about three hours from Switzerland and two hours from Austria and two hours from Poland and, and, and Czechoslovakia and, and uh, four hours from Italy. And then I, I like all these different cultures right here in, in, with, you know, with a quick drive. Mm. And so I'm kind of fascinated by that. Talk for a minute over the rainbow. You played uh, with Joe Lynn Turner a little while ago, 2009, for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I started the band, and uh, uh, the cancer got in the way. I had to leave. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm working with Jurgen Blackmore the whole time. We're doing a, we're doing two, pro we're producing two projects, and uh, but they went on and, and continued touring in 2000. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't make it. I was in the hospital, and then I was. Uh, actually too weak and everything. We had a lot of discussions and and then I was we talked actually if I was they're playing, they're playing now in June with the Scorpions and you know we talked about it and I said now nah, listen you guys go ahead I I'll, I'll stay cool before I go on a big tour. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a lot of fun but it didn't it, the cancer got in the way it didn't work. Any way you're going to join back over the rainbow? Huh? Yeah, well I didn't really leave. I mean I got sick. <laughs> but uh, now they got a guy Paul Morris with them, and he was in the last Rainbow edition, and he's great, so they're having fun. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I, w I was thinking about coming back, but then actually what, what getting sick like that changes your thinking, you know, and I, I really don't want to play covers. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea with Over the Rainbow was to play Rainbow songs just for a, a very short time and then have a new album. And... That doesn't seem to be the thinking of the other of the other members that they're still doing the rainbow set. And uh, I've talked a lot with Jurgen Blackmore about it. And we're do actually we're doing new new music, and we'll have a, a project out as soon as we can. Uh, actually, with me singing, which is a, a different sort of you know, thing. But it was a lot of fun with with uh, Bobby Rondinelli, Jolyn Turner, Greg Morris, uh, uh, Greg Smith. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we, I was along for the first Russian tour and the first Japanese tour, and they were a lot of fun. Cool. Because, and the, the kids went crazy. I mean, they, they hadn't heard it. Most of the kids were too young to have heard the music. You know, we, we, we recorded Rainbow Rising in '75. That's probably before you were born, dude. That was right before I was born. Yes. See, dude, awesome. Well, it's what yeah. it is. It's a great album. It's what it is. When's the last time you uh, spoke to Ronnie James Dio? A hundred years ago, I'm very sad about his passing, uh, especially because we got essentially the same disease, and I beat it and he didn't. Uh, the thing is, with, with stomach cancer, uh, I, I, this is a little bit blunt, but it is the truth that by the time you have symptoms, it's generally you don't have much chance. And it's the same with bladder cancer that I had, and uh, I was very, very, very lucky. And I know Ronnie had a lot of chemotherapy, and uh, it, it it wasn't a hopeful situation from the beginning. He was a great guy. We lo everybody loved him. You'll never hear anybody say anything bad about Ronnie Dio. You know, just a complete gentleman, a genius singer, and uh, it's a very sad thing. You know, back when you were recording Rainbow Rising, how was Ronnie in the studio back then? Well, exactly as I just described him. As a matter of fact, complete gentleman. Absolute genius. He would. He didn't say. He didn't say all that much. He was. Uh, we'd be in the studio, and he'd be upstairs in the hotel with his. He had a yellow, like a like a lawyer's pad that he'd used, and he'd be writing all these stories and and lyrics and everything. And of course, that was Stargazer and A Light in the Black and Terror Woman, and Long Live Rock and Roll and, and Kill the King and all that. And he had this this whole little book of, of lyrics. And in in those days, Richie. And Jimmy and Cozy would record the bottom track live. Then I would overdub the keyboards. I didn't play with them in the bottom track. And then Ronnie, of course, would come in last and sing. And uh, we did the whole Rainbow Rising album in, I mean, 20 minutes. I mean, nothing. And uh, uh, it just went, it was just a, such, it was like a, a, a really fast express train, you know, getting that, getting that down. They cut the... Musicland Studios in Munich, and that's actually where I got to learn Munich. It was with by Rainbow Rising. They they cut a storeroom open to make stone walls so that Cozy would get this monstrous drum sound. I remember that it was construction work, and then yeah, I was uh, 
the hotel was like in, in upstairs. It was the Sheraton Hotel, and underneath was the studio. And I, they called me up and come down. So you want to play some organ? You know, you want to play a moog? Sure. And then Ronnie'd be off writing lyrics, and he'd come down and sing something. And so we were, we didn't really know what we had. It, we we just wanted it to be quick and 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 feel like the live. Because in the rehearsals we were really hot. We were really a hot blues band, I thought, and and we wanted to get that, you know, jamming band. And I guess we did. So you're saying that this album was done really quick, written really quick, and became an instant classic. Uh, well, what's, what's instant classic? I mean, you know, the, the, no, it wasn't an instant classic. I mean, you know how much good music there was in the 70s? I mean, we were at that, at that point, in that same year, Bad Company came out yeah. with uh, Run With The Pack, I think, and Pink Floyd came out with Wish You Were Here, and uh, Zeppelin was around, and... There was so much good music in the '70s. I know, I knew we were good, but I didn't think it was, you know, a classic. I was 22. I was just a kid, you know, and uh, 21 even. And uh, uh, I knew, I knew how much energy we had, you know. But it, in those days, everybody had a lot of energy, and there was a lot of great albums. I'm, I'm glad that Rainbow Rising and Long Live Rock and Roll have stood up so well, actually. Because they uh, surely did become big classics, you know. Yeah, people tell me that, yeah. When you look uh, look into these, you know, albums again, do you, do you find that way of the classics in there, how they stand the test of time? To me it's blues rock. I mean, to me it's the, the Rainbow the the, the the version of Rainbow went through 10 versions, you know this. And uh had about 85 keyboard players and 200 drummers and and 17 singers. So the only constant really was Richie. And so but the first, the, few, the first Rainbow live troupe that we had was me and, and Cozy and Ronnie Ritchie and Jimmy Bain. We were, for me, more of an extension of Made in Japan mm -hmm. with a little, with, with, with Ronnie's like spooky thing on top, you know, swords and, and dungeons and, and the wizard and all that. But we, we would never play a song the same way twice, and we would, uh, uh, Richie and I would go back and forth trading leads and everything, and, and everybody had long solos. This means really, you know, classic rock. It was the old days, old school. And uh, uh, after that, the band became like more chart oriented, as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of lost interest. But the, in the time period, like '75, early '75, when we started playing, we were that was just what everybody was doing. You know, Uriah Heep was doing about the same type of thing. At, at, at that time, or maybe a little later, but uh, uh, Iron Maiden was being formed, and they were all. And uh, I come from a long line of, of like blues musicians and jazz musicians, and you know I can play all day on one note, you know, mm -hmm. and so can Richie. And Cozy was unstoppable, and so we just jam. And but but that was like for me the the vibe of the time of the period, you know. And then later the the music business completely went to well, where it is today with American Idol and everything, and, you know, it's, it's a different time. I'm not even being critical because you can't be critical, but it's a different time. A Light in the Black, you know, one of the best lead songs in there. What do you think of yeah. that song? Like, when you when you made it, did you say, wow, this is a really no, that's interesting what I'm saying. song? No, was just the period. I mean, Cozy, if you listen to what Cozy did in A Light in the Black, it's unbelievable. And, and I don't know how long it is, but you know, so, some nights it was 20 minutes long. And he's on a double bass drum, go do 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 on a double bass drum. It's just unbelievable the, the energy of the man. And but no, we took it for granted. We, I, we just, you know, okay, that's the way Rainbow plays. Let's play. And uh, if you have a tempo that's um, da, 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 then, then you have to play a solo. That's do 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 You have to play a fast solo over it. And we could all play and. The thing is, with 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 uh, Richie does a great solo in the Light in the Black, and I love the vocals, and I love the bass, and I love Cozy, what Cozy played. I didn't actually did I do anything? I did a solo. I know that you did a solo, played, yeah. I don't think I played organ on it on that one. I think it was all guitars. I don't remember. But uh, live, I played organ on it. We we we, did, we performed it a few times. I played the Hammond and then and then the solo. I remember I, the solo was one of the first times. I I, I have this sound. I play a mini moog through a guitar amplifier. Mm -hmm. That so it's distorted. And I think that's maybe the first time it was on record, and I've, I've that's my sound. I've I've used it ever since for hard rock. I mean, and uh, I I take a uh, well these days I don't use a mini moog, but I use something that sounds like a mini moog. You know, it's digital, and but I run it through a like a Marshall stack, 
and uh, so it's 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 kind of like a guitar from hell, you know. And uh, an interesting story about about the light and the black solo. I played it an octave higher. I played it at high high notes, and it was a really great solo. I was I thought it was really good. Martin Birch, the producer, he thought it was really good, and Ronnie thought it was really good. So we called Richie. Richie came in, listened to it, and he says, "Well, it's really good, but." You know, here comes the butt. Hmm. Could you do it lower, you know, like way lower? I said, yeah, sure. Go away. And he went away for two hours, and he came back, and I played it as the the, the solo that you now hear. I played it like two octaves lower and with this growl in it, this wow, 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 from the from the Minimo filter sweep controller. And Richie liked that. I remember he came back and he said, okay, that's more what I meant. Because his solo that follows it, he, he's in the high octave, you know. So it has a dynamic when I start low, and then he then he goes high. So that that's what he had in mind, and his his instincts were never ever wrong hmm. until he started thinking top forty. Excuse me, I didn't say that. <laughs> Marshalls versus PA system. So you're saying you're you're putting your equipment right to a Marshall stack? Well, uh, not not necessarily a Marshall, but actually, what works better is a small combo amp mm-hmm. uh, and a fuzz box. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and then you got that mic'd up. Then I got a mic up, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. These these days I play a laptop. I play a, a Mac laptop with an absolutely fabulous mini Moog sound, and I run it through a distortion. I use a program called Logic. The musicians will know what that is, and I just go direct out into the PA, and it's it's the monstrous sound, you know, and it's just huge. And I play a for Hammond. I use a a, a Nord lead. Uh, is made in Sweden, uh, like fake Hammond is the best Hammond sound I've ever heard. Mm. And that's the good part of the technology is that, that a Hammond used to weigh 200 kilos and, and a Leslie and all that, and then they'd break and you'd have to fix them and all this. And I can I can take my Hammond on a plane, it's smaller than a guitar, smaller than a cello, you know. So I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. And my laptop is really tiny, so I can take my whole setup just on the plane with me and check it in. I'm still, a, I'm still the loudest guy in town, you know. So today's equipment compared to back then, you prefer what is released today? Oh, absolutely, 100%. I would never, I would never go back. I mean, when the digital stuff started, it maybe wasn't as good. But we've been in the digital age now for 25 years, really. And, I mean, I got the first uh, the, the keyboards, what was it, a Roland D50 and a, and a Yamaha DX7. I got them in, I think, 84 and and they were this like this sound that you always hear on Whitney Houston records, this 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 blink 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 eighties sound. But then since then they've gotten better and better. And uh I don't use anything analog anymore because the, the, the analog simulators, the virtual instruments are just fine, they're just great. I just love them. And like I said, I don't want to ever carry another ham into my life, you know. At least get the roadies to carry it. Yeah, what are those? Uh Don Don Airy, by the way. Who's a you know great keyboard player? He he just changed over to the to a it, it looks like a Hammond B3, but it's digital and it only weighs like 60 kilos and it looks other and and that's all the wood you know. Mm-hmm. But he plays a digital Hammond and he says like I said I played it once in, in one of those and he says like I this is the best Hammond sound he's ever had, and it's digital you know it's not it's not analog it's all it's all simulation. It's got a little box you pull out underneath the keyboard that, that nobody can see really it's like a secret box you pull out and it's got all these presets and programs in it so it's really funny throughout your whole career you went from that and now you're going all digital yourself oh well i've been all digital for 20 years though i've been all digital forever and uh, uh i mean let's see i had my last hammond not 20 years but i had my last hammond in the early 90s about 95 15 years since wow. i since i had a hammond now i play them once in a while if i if i have a I make some guest appearances, and if there's a Hammond there, I'll play it. Sure. Okay. I mean, it, nothing looks better, you know. They look great, and but as far as just being able to get a completely, really realistic, heavy organ sound, I mean, this keyboard I use has draw bars, you know, like a Hammond, and you know, you, you, can, you can has everything a Hammond has has percussion, and uh, it's got the overdrive that I like. It, you know, it sounds like it's going through a Marshall stack, but it's not. Hmm. What type of pedal you use for that overdrive? Uh, it, it's, it's built into the instrument, and uh, it's, it's not. It's, it's part of the instrument. Everything's there. Okay. And uh, it, it's called overdrive, and, and uh, you could you, from zero to ten. I use it on about four, and that's like a really distorted Leslie. And then I have a, a pedal that uh, a foot switch that that speeds the Leslie up and down. Mm-hmm. And I have a volume pedal because half of Hammond playing is is volume. You have to do. 
you have to go from very, very soft to very, very loud. And uh, especially if you're playing alone like a solo piece, because that's all the dynamics, you know. You have to go from a really whisper to a scream. So I have a, I have a volume pedal and uh, a foot switch for the Leslie, and that's it. And then I have uh, the laptop with a small plastic keyboard that could uh, just MIDI controller, and uh, it sounds gigantic. Yeah, if you if you look at uh, the early Over the Rainbow shows from uh, 2009 in Russia, they're on YouTube. They're bootlegged. Mm -hmm. I'm playing this laptop, and it's, you can't believe the sound <laughs> as a as a mini moog. It's like the mini moog from Mars, you know. Wow, gotta check that out. Like I said, dude, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tr throughout your whole career, how many albums do you think you appeared on? Well, I produced about 50 for other people. I made 30 myself solo albums. That's 80. I appeared on maybe 110, maybe 120. I don't know. I, a lot of things I just sh did once. I did a, a, a song for Pat Travers way back when in the 70s. And I did some stuff for Jennifer Rush, just like one or two songs. And, Sessions. I also did like five movies in Germany and in a TV series. So if you count them, you know. And a lot of times people will call me just because they want a remix. Like I'll do a somebody they're having a problem with their record and then one song's just not working and that, that's the kind of call I get a lot. Like a fireman, you know, come up, put out the fire. Mm. And I'll, I'll, you know, the record will be great, but but they have this problem song they can't get it straight and I'll come in and fix it. And I do that a lot behind the scenes work but it's it's really rewarding because I blow my brains out in the studio every night you know and it's kind of my little secret you're like last time you were on stage with Ronnie James Dio do you recall that when would that have been I think it was Japan actually but I'm not sure or, oh no no it must have been Germany yeah I remember every night was every night was the same we were in uh, one dressing room and Richie was in his own and Richie would shut himself in with like a candle and a bottle of whiskey and when he was ready to play we'd play and sometimes we were an hour and a half late, and the audience would rip up the, the, the chairs. But it, like I said, it was the 70s. It was kind of expected. And Ronnie was hanging out with us, and, and, and Cozy would be getting dressed, and he'd be drumming on his knees with his drumsticks, and me and Jimmy would usually be laughing with goofballs. Hmm. And Ronnie was actually pretty serious, and, and Wendy was always with him, even in those days. That's how long they have been together, his wife Wendy, his manager. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She'd been with him. I guess they were together for over 40 years, and uh, we were, everybody was very relaxed. Actually, there wasn't there wasn't anything to lose. You know, when you go out and you play that energetic and that loud, there's this, this nothing to do with like a Broadway show or being nervous or anything. You go out there to kill. You know, you go out there to murder, and everybody like, oh, let's get it done. Let's do it. Come on, let's play. Except for Richie, and he'd he'd be I don't know getting his fortune told or reading tarot cards or something, and then eventually he'd show up and we'd play. Was Richie Blackmore always like that backstage since the beginning? Uh, you know, pretty much. I mean, he was he kept to himself. I mean, he he's, he's a hard guy to figure out, you know. I'll, I'll never say a, a bad word about him. and uh, He didn't like me. I mean, I know that, and I didn't really care uh, much, but... I was radically Californian, and he was radically British, and that was a, a major culture gap. The British were also cool, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't say much, and they have this dry humor, and I was like a surfer kid from California. That was a kind of a problem, and I was also, everybody in the band was 10 or 15 years older than me. I was the youngest. I was the baby in the band, so I, I didn't pay that much attention, but the point is when Richie came on stage, he was a, a giant, I mean, just unbelievable, and an inspiration, you know. And I, I tried to, I saw my job in that band as being, first of all, his second guitar, mm -hmm. like, and, and like, let him do what he wants, and I'll keep, the, the, keep it solid uh, on the Hammond. And then second of all, the guy that poked him in the ass a little bit and say, in the solos, you know, mm -hmm. say, hey, I can do this, can you do that too? You know, that kind of thing, and which he always needs. He always needs a little, a little competition. Unless it's too much competition, then he fires you. He didn't fire me. I left. Okay. But he fired everybody else. <laughs> wow. Ever meet Ingvim Malmsteen? Sure, many times. A great guy. I like him a lot. He's a, he's a gentleman. I met him in the 80s, and he was kind of a prick. He was kind of like full of drugs, but so was I, you know. And, like, everybody thought they were cooler than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, 
uh, I suppose I was as much of an asshole as Ingvi. And then I met him two years ago. We, we played a festival in Finland, and we shared the bill. He's a great guy. He's got a great family. He's happy with his life. I, I, I wish him all the best. He's a fabulous guitar player. For sure. Yeah. Well, Tony, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, taking no, it your time. No, it sucked. Do you hear the birds still? Yeah, they're singing. I was going to say it sucked. I didn't have any fun at all. J just kidding. <laughs> you're, you're a comedy man. You're awesome. I'm a funny guy. Listen. Oh, for nothing. My, my pleasure. That's my job. <laughs> Just taking the time. Okay, hang in there, man. All right. You have a good uh, night there, and uh, same, I'll have a good day. Same to you, kiddo. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.